I'm Lolly Lewis. Most everybody knows me already, but I'm the founder of Amateur Music Network. Thank you. And uh, we are really pleased to be able to bring people together to make music, even though we can't be um, in person together, we're together online. And uh, that's important for all of us to continue to feel like we're musicians. So um, our intention is for it to be fun and convivial and that it's not a show, it's a workshop. And if you have questions, uh, probably best to do it through the chat, probably best to mostly stay muted. That way everybody can play along and experiment without us, you know, with us still being able to hear Jeff. And, um, and, uh, so questions in chat, we'll have a little time at the end for a little extra chat. And one thing I did want to um, mention is that we've added a, um, Jeff has given us a chart of all the uh, techniques he's going to be talking about today. And I've just put a link in the chat to our, it's the same resources page, but I've added the, um, this document so you can follow along with the list of the techniques while Jeff is talking. Everybody see that in the chat? Look, it's Phil Otto. You look like a lamp, Phil. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'd love to uh, hear a little bit about sort of your path, how you particularly got interested in contemporary music and and into the alternative and weird sounds of the wonderful clarinet. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and making weird sounds and talking about them is one of my favorite things. So I'm excited to see all of you. Um, I will encourage you all to um, get your instruments out if you'd like to play along with what we're doing. Um, I have about, I don't know, 25 or 30 techniques that we're gonna get through over the course of the hour. Um, and we're gonna focus, I'm focusing mostly on the breadth of them, but we will sort of talk about the mechanics of how to do some of them. Um, so my background is I, um, you know, I started playing clarinet in the school band program when I was in fourth grade. I went to UCLA for my undergrad and the San Francisco Conservatory for my master's. And um, while I was at UCLA in my undergrad, um, I started playing bass clarinet. And one of my really good friends was a composer. And some of my initial forays into bass clarinet playing produced some very unusual sounds, which at the time I thought were horrible mistakes and he thought were just totally delightful. And he's like, what was that? What was that? Do it again. Can you do it on purpose? I was like, no, I don't want to do that on purpose. That was a mistake. He said, no, 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 no. I love that. I'm writing a piece and it's going to feature that sound heavily. Um, and so that kind of inspired me like, well, it is kind of a cool sound. It just doesn't sound like a clarinet. Um, at the same time, I sort of got interested in contemporary music and some sort of experimental clarinetists. Um, there's a great album, I'll put it in the chat, um, uh, called by Evans Porn called This Is Not a Clarinet. Uh, oh, not a clarinet, not a clarinet. Um, and it's an amazing album that just, he has a bunch of different pieces where he's playing clarinet and bass clarinet in these really unusual ways. And that was really inspiring for me as well. Um, when I got to the conservatory for my master's, I was practicing one of Evan's pieces in a practice room and uh, on bass clarinet. And this other person uh, knocked on the door and said, what is that crazy, like, I can't believe you're playing this piece. And that was my co-squonk um, conspirator, John Russell. And that was sort of how we met was he heard me playing this really obscure bass clarinet piece. Um, and so we started working together as this bass clarinet duo Squonk, um, which, you know, we've, you know, commissioned a bunch of pieces and sort of explored a lot of unusual bass clarinet sounds and techniques. Um, I was also a member for a long time of the Edmund Wells Bass Clarinet Quartet, which is a heavy metal bass clarinet band um, that, again, would use some of these sounds to sound like an electric bass or a distorted guitar or 
playing with a really specific tone to sound more like a vocalist or like a heavy metal vocalist in particular. So that was sort of a, um, a playground for me to learn some of these sounds. And then just through my own interests, I just have done a ton of contemporary music playing. I'm a member of the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players. Um, I've just done a lot of um, commissioning and working with composers and, and things like that. And so these sounds have, um, they've all just sort of been asked of me at one time or another. And so sometimes I'll come to a new piece and, oh, I have i don't know that sound, like I'll better figure out what that is. Um, and a lot of them are, um, yeah, some, there's some, also some really standard sounds that like everyone should know. Um, and what I've realized as I became a teacher, um, so I'm also chair of the wind department at the conservatory now, and I teach clarinet and chamber music. Um, and what I realized through my teaching is that um, these sounds, even though they are very strange, some of them, actually have made me a better clarinetist in all aspects of clarinet playing. So not just as an experimental clarinetist, but that being able to make these strange sounds has made my traditional playing better in a lot of ways. And we'll talk about that more as the day goes on. Um, and there are a couple sort of um, things for us to think about as we're, as we're doing this. You know, one of the things is we all play the clarinet and we all sort of, oh, I wanna make a beautiful sound on the clarinet. Great, that's wonderful. Now, what happens if something, if you're playing, uh oh and i squeak right now is that a squeak what is that squeak why did that squeak happen is that just a mystery did an elf come in and sort of do something no that is something that i did with my mouth and that created a squeak or i put a wrong key down and a squeak happened so if i know what i'm actually doing when i make a mistake and i can replicate that mistake on purpose then that means when I do it again, I can choose not to do it. And so for, you know, there's a lot of times if I'm trying to play a high note and the wrong high note comes out, I'll actually play the wrong one on purpose a bunch of times to know exactly where it is so that I can play the right one afterwards. And so that's been a big um, influence, uh, or it's like an important part of my teaching and my learning as a clarinetist. And then the other side of that, I would say, is um, we have this device, this technological device that does make sort of standard tone, but it also has these other sounds in it. And I just think it's really interesting to know what are the other sounds that we can make with it. Even if a comp you, know, you never have to do it in your playing, I think it's just sort of a shame that we would all just place the normal basic middle of the road sounds when we have this device that can make all of these incredible sounds. Um, so I would encourage you all to just play with your instrument and just see what kind of sounds come out. And once you get into that space, you realize that there are no mistakes anymore. <laughs> There's no sounds that aren't supposed to happen all the sounds are supposed to happen and then you can just choose when you want one of these sounds to happen or not um so oh phil can you um mute yourself please i'm getting a little go thanks um so on this document which i could do a screen share but if you want to have the document up you can just have it like side by side and that's probably better um, I have this funny review that I got. His bass clarinet was making sounds like a ghoul in some deep cavern, tormenting a traditional Georgian religious chant, which I love. In truth, the end result sounded like a lot of growling and roaring noises that were not exactly pleasant, but golly, what an impressive work and what a knockout performance it was, which I think is just like such a delightful review to receive, <laughs> especially for someone who's like in the experimental music world. And it's like, you know, you can tell he didn't quite care for it, but like that's exactly what I was going for in a, in, in a lot of ways for that particular piece. Um, so I have these um, categories uh, within sort of extended techniques. And there's a lot of ways you could sort of, um, you know, scientifically determine which what they all are. But the way I think about these techniques are we have a whole category, which is just taking normal playing and pushing past it. So just, I call it breaking boundaries. 
Um, then we have a whole category just on articulation, so different ways of articulating the, uh, starting the note, basically. How do we start the note? There's a lot of different ways. Then there's a big category on timbre alterations. So once we've started the note, what can we do to change the sound as it's happening? Um, then we start getting very strange indeed, and we get into what I'm calling new sounds, which are more of the sound effect type things, where it's just, that's, no one would ever confuse that for a clarinet. How do the clarinet even make that sound? Um, and then the final category is uh, multiphonics, which is playing more than one note at the same time, which is also something you would not expect a clarinet to be able to do. We're usually famous for being monophonic, that we only produce one note at a time. Um, so I'm just going to try to get through as many of these as I can just to sort of like open up everyone's ears and I'll tell you what I'm doing so that you can try to do it yourself and then we'll save some time at the end if there are maybe two or three techniques that everyone's really excited about delving more into the mechanics of how to do it then we'll sort of focus on that at the end. Um, but please do ask questions um, as we go on if, if something isn't making sense or you want to hear it again or does that work at high notes or low notes or different dynamics? Like all those kinds of things. Like, please, please ask those sorts of questions. Um, okay, so the first category in breaking boundaries, um, the first one is circular breathing. And this of course is not a clarinet only technique. Um, this is something where, what if I wanna play a note that lasts a minute long or two minutes long or five minutes long? I think the longest I've ever circular, I think I, it's maybe like two minutes or something, but it's usually just because you get bored, <laughs> not because you sort of like run out of energy. And so the theory behind circular breathing, and there are a couple of guides um, in the document, is that as you're blowing out, you poof your cheeks out and you fill your cheeks with air and your cheeks become sort of like a second set of lungs. So, and then the tricky part is while your cheeks are poofed out, you inhale while you squeeze in on your cheek. So it looks like this. So I'm inhale while I squeeze the cheeks in. And then I exhale. So you're, you're pushing air out, your cheeks inhale, It's best to practice with like a straw or with making that raspberry sound. But the nice thing is with the clarinet, you know, I could just do that for basically the, the limiting factor is that your mouth starts to fill with drool and then you can't, uh, <laughs> you can't play anymore. Um, so that's, you know, this is one that I would, I use all the time in any type of playing, just if there's a phrase in Brahms that I want to be a little bit longer or Mozart or, or whatever. Um, but there are also definitely um, contemporary pieces that ask you to just continue playing this note for a really long time. Um, so that's circular breathing. That's a really just handy one to know. The next one in Breaking Boundaries is quarter tones. Um, and so quarter tones are the notes that are in between the half steps. Um, so, you know, if we have C, if we have E, and we have E flat, then in between E and E flat is E quarter flat. If you want to know what I'm doing, so you play E flat with one side, and then you add the other E flat key, and then you go to E. So E flat, E quarter flat, E, E quarter flat, E flat, E quarter flat, E. Um. And you can sort of like, at, at, with a lot of practice, you can actually play a quarter tone chromatic scale that would you go over the range of the whole instrument. Um, I have not perfected a quarter tone chromatic scale personally, but it is something that you could do. Um, there are a couple great fingering charts available for quarter tones. Um, 
And it's kind of a funny thing, um, but it can also be quite beautiful. Um, you know, it's sort of like playing around in between all the different notes um, as just sort of a little improvisation exercise or something. Um, but quarter notes are fairly commonly asked for in contemporary music as well. Um, but you, it's another one where it's it's fairly simple to do, but you just have to look up the fingering and, and see what it is. And the fingerings are all, always available. Um, the next one is a particular favorite of mine, which is extreme dynamics. Um, Often we know that clarinets are super good at playing very, very softly, right? And there's that famous moment in the um, Abyss of the Birds from the Quartet for the End of Time where you start on this note that goes from nothing. I mean, usually we've all sort of figured out how to play very soft. Um, but I like to figure out how to play really, really loud. <laughs> um, and there's a limit when sort of we all know like a forte sound and maybe like fortissimo, but have any of you actually played the loudest possible note that you can play on your instrument? Like, have, have any of you ever just blow the hardest air that you possibly can? If you haven't, I would invite you to do that right now. And the sound will get pretty raunchy, but that's okay. We're just going for sheer volume. So, you know, we usually think of like the loudest clarinet sound. It's like, oh, it's very loud, but what about this like really raucous, nasty kind of a sound. What happens? Like, why don't we ever play that way? You know, I mean, it gets a little flat, whatever, who cares? Like, what, isn't it, it's like so fun. It's so fun to just, you know, just really unload and just unleash, just like, this is so loud. Um, and this is another one where if you're trying to find a beautiful loud sound and you've never played beyond your loudest sound of beautiful loud sound you're never going to get there right if you always stop your crescendo when it stops getting beautiful then you'll never be able to increase that volume right it's like strength an athlete who's running the mile they don't just run the mile in their workouts they run two miles so that a mile feels easy so the same thing with us with dynamics. If I want to play a really loud, beautiful note, I have to push beyond that into the ugly notes. I mean, I wouldn't even call it ugly, into the raucous side of the clarinet notes so that I can back away from there a little bit and then that will sound more beautiful because I've figured out how to just use the maximum amount of air as I'm playing. Um, so yeah, that's a really fun one. And the key with that one is just, just like a lot of air you kind of drop your lip a little bit um, and stay relaxed in your body. If you get tense, you'll actually get softer. And so you want to stay like really, really relaxed with just the maximum amount of air that you can get out of your instrument. Um, great. And then the final category in Breaking Boundaries would be Extreme Altissimo. Um, there's a great uh, book by Tom Ridnour that has uh, extreme altissimo fingerings. Um, I have another one from uh, one of the professors at Arizona State that I'll, I've asked him if I can share on this and I'll, I, I should be able to put it up um, once I hear back from him. But th this applies to the same thing too, where, you know, everyone's highest note, like what's the highest note we can all play comfortably? Is it a G? Is it an A? Is it a C maybe? Like a double high C? Um, you never want to have a piece that asks for the highest note that you can play, right? Because then there's a lot of psychological terror around like, oh no, this asks for my highest note. What if I can't play my highest note, right? That becomes really scary. So if I have a piece with a high C in it, I don't want that to be set be scary to me. So I want to be having Like high E flat is my high, highest scary note. And that will always be scary to me, but that means that high C is no longer scary because I can play way higher than that. 
right? And so the same thing would apply if right now your highest comfortable note is like a high A or something like that. Then you should be practicing a little bit higher than that so that your high A is no longer the highest note for you and that starts to feel more comfortable. And it'll just happen naturally as you practice those higher notes. Um, so yeah, I would, you know, highly recommend that. But for me, it was like really great because I did start coming into pieces in contemporary music that would have a high C in it or sometimes a high C sharp. And while that was my highest note, it was very challenging. But once I figured out how to play D and E flat, oh, the other notes, oh, C, oh my gosh, what I wouldn't give for a high C now, right? Like it just becomes so much more relaxing to, to find those notes once you've pushed past them. Um, good, all right. That's our breaking boundaries section. I mean, maybe I'll pause between each section. Are there any questions about any of these um, these techniques or ideas? Are you all playing like super high, super high notes? Do you want to know my high, my double high D fingering is just like a regular high D, but you just like keep going higher. <laughs> so it's just. Just, I mean, I, didn't, I shouldn't say just, but that is the fingering for it. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to articulation. So fun ways to start the note. So normally we think of, we have the clarinet, we have the mouthpiece, we have our tongue, and the tip of the tongue bounces off the tip of the mouthpiece with the most minimum amount of effort and the minimum amount of effect just to stop the reed from vibrating. But what if we don't? What if we apply more tongue in more different ways? Um, so the uh, one really fun one is the slap tongue, which probably a lot of you have heard. So that's this sound. And the way that works, it's called a slap tongue because it sounds like a slap, but you're not actually slapping the reed with your tongue. What you're actually doing, and I'll pardon you to show my tongue, you're grabbing you're grabbing the tongue with your reed and creating suction between your reed and your tongue. And you pull the reed away from the mouthpiece and then it pops off and it pops against the mouthpiece, that's what makes that sound. So the best way to practice that is actually to take your reed off and try to grab it. Try to grab it with your tongue. Um, and you really are sort of curving your tongue this way to make a little air pocket between the tongue and the reed. Uh, there are a few really good videos um, on the internet that show this as well. Um, it's easier with a bigger reed, so if you have a bass clarinet reed, I would actually recommend starting with, with that. Um, it's a lot easier. This is one that does not exist on oboe, unfortunately. You have a tongue ram instead, which is much more satisfying. Um, so yeah, so slap tongue, that's what slap tongue is. You're pulling the reed away and then it pops off. And I think we can all know what the uh, sort of practical applications of this is if you want to sound like an electric bass or someone knocking on the door or <laughs> um, just a really percussive articulated sound. <laughs> you know, you can make this like really fun, fun sound. Within slap tongue, there are two kinds of slap tongues. There's these closed slaps, which is when you have the slap plus the pitch, when your mouth is closed around your mouthpiece. Then there's also an open slap, which is more like a pop if you open your mouth, which is. And that's more of just like a, like a rim shot on a snare drum or something like that, where it's just you know, just, just the pure percussion sound. Um, so yeah, that one takes, takes some, some getting used to. You do need to be able to, to roll your tongue like that. Um, exactly, exactly. Luis has got it. Um, John, my squonk partner, can't roll his tongue and he can't slap tongue because he can't, like he just can't make his tongue grab the reed in that way. Um, the other uh, articulation 
There's no actual suction with the breath. Correct. Yeah, you're you're pushing out with the air. Um, the tongue creates suction, but it's between those two surfaces. It's sort of like if you like making that um, like a fart sound with your hands. It's like it feels like it feels like that. Or if you squeeze them together, you can like create a little suction that you that you pop off. Um, okay, the next articulation is double tonguing. Um, and double tonguing, of course, is, you know, very common in brass players. It's easier in brass and it's easier in flute because they don't have something in their mouth. <laughs> so they can just say, digga, 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 and it will sort of disturb the sound. So the idea, if anyone isn't familiar with how double tonguing works, is the d is when your tongue touches the reed, and then the g is when the back of your tongue touches the palate in your mouth, the top of your mouth. So some people say tukka 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 tukka, um, but that's a little too disruptive. So the better syllable is actually dugga 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 dugga, like DG. Um, and so you need to practice just without the instrument going like dugga 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 until you can do that pretty fluently. And then you want to add it to your instrument. And the best way to practice it is in tiny, at first, is in tiny bursts. Or... Just short bursts, and then... And then... I'm like a medium double tonguer. Um, like I can do it great on sustained notes, but I can't like do scales and things like that um, all the way up and down. There's an incredible video, if we weren't so short on time, and maybe at the end I can play it, of this Agid duo playing Flight of the Bumblebee. It's super, super worth watching when we're done. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so double tonguing, of course, is great because um, you can, uh, you know, you can articulate faster. Um, it also just, you know, you can just sound like a string tremolo. Or like a cembalom or some, some like other instrument that's not a clarinet. And in fact, if you want to sound, go even farther in that direction, um, there's what I call brush tonguing, which is when the tip of the tongue brushes back and forth across the tip of the reed this way. So top, up, and down. And that really sounds like a tremolo because it's a little bit irregular, um, but it'll sort of go up and down as you sort of you're just like tickling the tip of the reed basically with your tongue, just sort of going going up and down on it. Um, so those are our articulation effects. How does anchor tonguing worth work or complicate these techniques? So I anchor tongue, and anchor tonguing actually helps slap tonguing. <laughs> um, in order to slap tongue, you need to bring the middle of the re of your tongue to the tip of the reed. So you actually have to slide your tongue forward. And when I was, this is like one of the sounds when I was learning how to play bass clarinet, um, because I anchor tongue, I was just getting a slap tongue every time I tried to articulate a low note by accident. Um, and so it, it does help that particular technique. For the other ones you do need, it does make it more complicated. So brush tongue, you need to bring it back. And double tonguing, it's actually easier if you do tip tonguing. And that's one of the reasons I struggle with double tonguing is because I have to bring my, my tongue back up. Um, and so that gets a little more complicated. Um, but yeah, anchor tonguing is, uh, yeah, helps it one and hurts the other one, unfortunately. <laughs> Good question. Uh, any other articulation questions before we jump ahead? Um, okay, now we're getting to some fun stuff. Now we're getting to some fun stuff. So we're in timbre alterations. And we'll start with the most, probably the most common uh, clarinet extended technique that's asked for, which is flutter tonguing. And there are two ways we can flutter tongue. The uvular flutter tongue and the a velolar flutter tongue. Oh, why would you say these words? <laughs> so basically, it's the Spanish R versus the French R. 
So the French R is the uvular one because it it is the near the uvula in the back of your mouth that is um, sort of vibrating. And the Spanish one is the tip of your tongue that vibrates against the top of your mouth. So if you can already produce a Spanish rrr or a French rrr, then I would just go with whichever one of those you can do. Usually people can do like one of those, but not the other one. Um, and so whatever one you can do, do that one. And it's called, I mean, that is flutter tonguey. Like flutter tonguey is basically just, you're playing a note and it's like garbled in that way. Um, and so, yeah, so on clarinet, that sounds the French one, the back of the throat is and the tip, the front is so I'm a little better at the back one uh, as well. Um, it gets a little harder as you go up into the uh, clarion. Um, because you're your tongue ends up being a little bit low in the back, so it's easy to squeak. The solution for that is just a lot of air, a lot of air and a lot of support. You'd have to blow really, really hard to make those, to make it work as you go up higher. Um, so that's the flutter tongue. It can be the back or the front. You can also, if you really want to go wild, you can do both, which is... <laughs> which is a very silly sound. Um, but if you can do both sounds, like why not combine them? Like what a weird, delightful sound that is in some ways. It's maximum flutter, double flutter, triple flutter. You know, if you like your flutters with a lot of, a lot of juice in there. Um, so that's flutter tonguing. Um, the next technique is glissandi, uh, which is super, super fun. Now, glissandos can happen across the entire range of the instrument, but they are, of course, easiest um, the higher that you get on the instrument. If you have a really low glissando, then it's going to be by just using your fingers and sliding them off of the keys. <laughs> So I'm just moving the keys very, moving my fingers very slowly or opening a key really, really slowly. It helps again with most, most of the techniques, it's going to be a lot of air and just loosening your lower jaw a little bit. As you get higher, you can start to use actually your embouchure and your tongue to make the gliss happen. So if you start like on a thumb C, and what I'm saying is, right so there's sort of like the back of my tongue is sort of moving this way as I move my tongue back and forth it alters the um, it alters the pitch uh, as you go even higher Right, you can sort of, it gets easier the higher you get um, to just sort of like, you know, sound like a siren. <laughs> right, you can just sort of like make all those sounds. Once you get really high, it gets easier, but that's a lot harder to do. Um, but of course you can, you can do it a little bit in the middle of the instrument. I can tell some people are loving this, which I appreciate. <laughs> um, so that's glissandi. I mean, we could have a whole workshop just on how to do glissandi. Um, I would recommend um, starting as high as you can. Just pick a really high note and then just start moving your tongue around and see what happens. <laughs> and like something, whatever comes out will be sort of success. Just like. You just play a high G and just sort of like drop your embouchure and then drop it farther and drop it farther and drop it farther until 
until you sort of get bigger and bigger glisses. But I actually like the low ones too, are pretty fun. <laughs> kind of nice that could be like a very beautiful kind of haunting haunting sound uh all right next up is vibrato and tremolo now does anyone know the difference between vibrato and tremolo this is a pop quiz i'll bet you didn't know there was going to be a pop quiz sky you might know do you know the difference between vibrato and tremolo put you on the spot one changes the pitch and the other changes the uh frequency of getting louder and softer. Yes, so one of them, so uh, vibrato changes the pitch, so it changes the frequency, and tremolo changes the amplitude, mm -hmm. right? So it gets louder and softer. So if you think of a, um, a string instrument, when they do their vibrato, what are they changing? They're changing the pitch, right? Because they're moving their finger up and down. When a flute does vibrato, <laughs> Or a singer, oh, what are they changing? They're changing the volume, right? They're not going, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, so different instruments use this effect differently. Um, what is oboe does a more of a, um, a breath one, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, for clarinet, we can do both. We can do either. Usually, we're going to do a, a lip vibrato which is changing the pitch so if i exaggerate it which i'm just going like whoa 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 i'm just like opening my mouth a little bit but we can also do it with our diaphragm which is a a bit of a different sound um, but usually because like in klezmer music and jazz music, they're using their mouth. Usually people expect the clarinet to be like, <laughs> to be doing a, um, a lip vibrato, which is changing the pitch. Um, but you can work on both. And some clarinets prefer to do a breath, a tremolo instead. Um, so that's that. Um, then we have tambral trills, which the technical term for that is bisbigliando. If you want to get a nice Italian word in your dictionary, bisbigliando. It sounds like a, a pizza or something. I don't know. Um, and so a tambral, the timbre is the sound. So a tambral trill is adjusting the sound of the note. For the clarinet, usually that means I'm playing a note and I'm going to add some lower keys to just adjust the sound. So, It's a, it, it changes the sound, but not, I mean, it, maybe it's changing the pitch a tiny little bit, but mostly it's just changing the sound. Some really common bisbiglandos is if you have two ways of playing the same note, like E flat, you can just alternate between those two fingerings. Or F sharp between two and fork. Would that work if I do C sharp to C sharp? Will I get a bisbigliando? No, because that's the same tone hole is opening and closing for that one, right? So that won't work on this one. Um, but it will work with E flat because that's opening two different keys. It'll work with F sharp or, or this F sharp from this one to this one. <laughs> And a composer would ask for that if they just want like a new sort of, you know, something to be happening to the note that's not changing the, the pitch of the note, but it's just changing the sound of it. Um, so that's bisbigliando. And then we have the final one in this category is double trills, which is a similar thing. So if there's a way for me to play to trill from E to E flat or E to E flat, I can go this way 
and do a double trill, which allows me to do it twice as fast. So if I can go, and I can go, I can go, or if this is where the pinky keys are great. Those are super fun. You guys should try those. Those are easy to do. I can even, if I'm like trilling from C to D, I can take my other hand and put it in here. <laughs> or I can... Uh... That's a really, really fun sound, um, the double trill, because it's just like, brrrr, but you are actually changing the pitch. Um, you are actually doing a trill, but it's just so fast. Uh, and I know there's some really good ones on oboe as well for this too. Um, yeah, and for me, it's kind of, you know, if you're just bored sometime while you're practicing, like, can you find a double trill? Like, can you find another double trill to do? Can you get your thumb up somewhere to like do a, <laughs> do a weird double trill somewhere. Um, good, all right, so those are, oh my gosh, we're just running out of time. Those are our uh, timbre alterations. So I'm just gonna blow through some of these other ones to make sure that we get through them all. We have teeth on the reed. So that's just putting your bottom teeth on the reed, which makes a very, very high sound. It could be soft or it could be loud, um, soft, or, you know, some horrible, really loud one. There are key clicks that composers will ask for. That's not my favorite technique because, you know, I actually spend a lot of money to have my clarinet be silent. <laughs> so then when a composer asks for a key click, I'm like, well, I just spent like $500 to not have it do that. <laughs> Ask a saxophone player for that one. Um, but it is asked for a lot. Uh, there's tongue ram, which we steal from flute. Um, and that's actually a great one for oboe, especially if you take your reed off and do it directly into the body. Um, that's an okay one. Um, there's the bugle call, which is when you block off the bottom of your bell with your leg. Let's see if I can do this on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> and that's a good like practice for playing in the different overtone series. You're gonna have to like yeah do a weird <laughs> contortion to get it. Um, there's the didgeridoo, which is if you take your mouthpiece off and buzz into it. <laughs> While you have your um, mouthpiece off, there's something like a palm pop. Right, so you can play a song there. And that was called for in a, a few pieces that I've done have actually asked for. Have asked for that technique. Um, there's air sounds, right? Just, you know, blowing. Um... And that can be sort of with the keys moving. It can be with a syllable, you know, sometimes they'll ask for or, or you know, different kinds of, of effects that way, which are pretty fun. Uh, and then I have invented an extended technique, everybody. This is called the Ander Ram. <laughs> and the Ander Ram is sort of a magic trick. It works better on bass clarinet, but it does work. <laughs> so 
So I actually have the clarinet not in my mouth and you blow air super, super, super hard at the reed. And if you blow the air hard enough, you will get a note to speak. <laughs> it's also like a good way to see if you're using enough air in your instrument because you have to blow really hard. Do you try and have an embouchure like a flute player or something? No, it's a clarinet embouchure, like a really, a really small, like you're blowing out of a straw. So really, really small and tight. And um, see how far, you know, the true, on bass clarinet, I can do it probably like three or four inches away from my mouth because it's a bigger, a bigger opening. But with clarinet, you can still, you know. <laughs> I can play the clarinet when it's not in my mouth, everybody. <laughs> and you can too. Um, so that's a really fun one. And then we also have playing it like a flute. And I learned this technique three days ago in preparation for this. Let's see if I can still do it. Oh, I lost it. Oh, how disappointing. The video that I learned how to do it from is on there, but that's a really neat sound. So you just sort of put it at like a 45 degree angle and parallel to the ground. That's neat. I've always wanted to do that one. I didn't think I could do it, and I learned how to do it on Thursday. <laughs> um, and the final one in this category is whisper squeaks, which is this... where you just blow really gently uh, across the tip of the mouthpiece. And you get this very like delicate little sort of like ants ice skating kind of a sound, which I really like. Um, okay, so that's our uh, new sounds and there's, many more that could go in that list, um, especially once you start taking the clarinet apart and you can like add tubing between the pieces and put a, like a duck call in the top of the mouthpiece or like a, you know, a trombone mouthpiece will fit in the barrel actually pretty well. Like once you get into that world, there's like a lot of weird sounds you can do, but these are the sort of more common fun ones that are easier, easier to access. <laughs> And then the final category is multiphonics, which is playing more than one note at the same time. Um, there are different categories for this. Um, and so the first category is fingered multiphonics. And this is when you use a special fingering in order to have these multiphonics speak. And basically what's happening is instead of playing a G, if I open up a key higher on the instrument, then the air is now coming out of here and it's coming out of here. And so it creates this weird multiphonic because the tube is open in two different places. Uh, so a really good one is if you play a G, like a long G, and then you add the E flat key with your index finger. Or another good one is uh, one, two, three with no thumb. Um, and I've put a couple different resources on the document for just huge lists of, of fingering charts of these. And these you would never memorize the fingerings for all these. You would always look it up. And if a composer asked for it in a piece, they would include the fingering with it as well um, because there are too many for a clarinetist to memorize. Um, so that's fingered multiphonics. 
Then we have what I call overtone multiphonics, and those are when you pick a low note, like a low F or a low E, and then you overblow a higher note, which you could just do as a way of playing a high note. Right, so that's all with the same fingering. But if I sort of squeeze those notes together, then I get... That's my other favorite. After slap tonguey, that's probably my favorite sound. <laughs> um, those don't work on oboe either. They're not a double reed thing. Darn. But you've got some beautiful multiphonics that, yeah, you don't, yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, again, you're just playing a low note. And um, the way to practice it is to do that exercise that I just did where you jump up. If you can hit some of those notes up there, and then you just kind of stay on one of those notes and let the low note kind of emerge. It has a lot to do with how much uh, lower jaw pressure you apply. As you push in and out of it, you'll get, you'll get those notes to happen. Daniel's wondering how much air you use. Lots of air. It's always more air. The answer to all these techniques is if it's not working, more air for all of them. For double tonguing, for flutter tonguing, for anything. It's like they all require more air and generally a looser bottom, bottom lip, like bottom jaw. You just kind of loosen that and apply a lot more air and then that's, that's going to help for all of them. Feeling dizzy. Oh, that's great. You missed number five, timbre. What was that one? Sorry, I, I missed think, that. I think that must be timbral. Oh, the didgeridoo? No, we did it. But the, we did didgeridoo, the, yeah. But there, Oh, timbre. This... One, two, three, four. Oh, the double trills? I, I don't mean you missed it. I meant I didn't get it, whatever number five was. Oh, uh, double. Was before, just before key clicks. Before key clicks. Oh, that's teeth on reed. Yeah, that was it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um... Let's see. Could you demonstrate um, that again? Oh, sure, yeah. So it's going to be very quiet. And very, it'll be very high, or it can be very loud. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's not an indoor sound. It's an outdoor noise, <laughs> I would tell my children. Um, the other um, multiphonic, so playing more than one note at the same time, would be singing while you play. So like singing through your instrument. I mean, you can practice this if you can hum and whistle. That's a good way to practice it without your instrument. And that's. if it's a consonant note like if I sing a fifth or a third it can also be very crunchy if I sing a like a minor second so I'm singing a, a minor second sounds like a flutter tongue right and if you can't flutter tongue you can actually hum a note <laughs> And you'll get something that sounds like a flutter tongue because the beats between the two notes um, create that create that dissonance there. Um, but I like the more beautiful part way, you know. I think it can be a very very beautiful sound. Then there's this other weird sort of newish technique called circular singing, which you have to be able to circular breathe to do it. Uh, so basically you, you hum through your nose while you're doing the circular breathe. It's like really weird. <laughs> Um, there's an amazing Martin Frost uh, video of him him doing it that you can see, see him soon do it really well. Um, 
and someone actually wrote a dissertation about the difference between singing and playing and humming and playing and it's like a whole like how the two techniques work and when you would see them and what they're used for um and that is my list of techniques oh my gosh we did a lot today <laughs> so um it's fantastic jeff really? yeah so i think yeah so i think some questions are probably in order and if you we have time i'm happy to go like a few minutes later if we want to um if there are one or two techniques that you guys want to learn more about the mechanics of how to produce them or like when they would come up or whatever but maybe we can just start with a couple questions first while people are writing i just really agree about the beauty of the multiphonics because you know chords are so emotional inherently yeah you know and so the clarinet such an emotional instrument to me you know it's just so it's such a wonderful sound and to be able to kind of have broadened it out into chords. I'm just, I think it's really beautiful, so. Yeah, I can maybe play a piece of mine where I do that like a, as a goodbye thing or something. Okay, so any tips for practicing singing and playing at the same time? So I would practice with the whistle, if you can whistle. Um, <laughs> practice it that way first, because it is, a lot of these techniques are just asking you to do two different things that you haven't combined before. And so for me, it was helpful to do it without the clarinet in my mouth first. And once I could sort of understand that like, oh, right, there are two places I can create pitch inside my head, um, then it was easier to do with the instrument. Um, for Also for most of these techniques, start with an open G on the clarinet and then apply the technique to that, <laughs> right? Because we don't want to be doing some like hard note, just an open G and if that doesn't work, try a low E, right? Because it'll either be easier on an open G or a low E and then you can just like sort of figure it out. But on an open G, oh. <laughs> Just sort of like try to make pitch, include pitch in the air that you're blowing out. This is a hum. It's oh, it's like it's down here. It's where it's coming from. That looks like it. Anybody else? So before, before we ask you to play us out with something really pretty, I just want to mention that I'll be putting the archive video online on the resources page and I'm going to send you a reminder about that. Oh good, we've got a couple, a little bit more questions. Oh sure. But also I'm going to send out just a little survey that I'd really appreciate if you guys just give us a little feedback on, on this workshop's first one we've done for wins. So I, I would be really grateful. This has worked out, I thought, really well, Jeff, and partly because your audio system is really set up nicely. Oh, good. I'm glad. And it, yeah. that's, um, <laughs> would you show the folks the microphone that you use? Sure, yeah. I just have this, um, it's a USB microphone I plug directly in. It's this little Shure, I think it's an MKV or something. It was like 80 bucks, 100 bucks or something. Yeah. If you're spending a lot of time on Zoom, a fifty to a hundred dollar USB mic will make a huge difference on the quality of your life and how that, you are perceived. Yeah, <laughs> in that the one world. seems to work really well for the instrument. So yeah, here's yeah. one more question. Any tips uh oh, read strengths? Um not really. If you're using too soft of a reed, it'll be hard to play really high because the reed will start to collapse. So you need to have a, a fairly firm reed to get some of these really high sounds. Um, if your reed gets too strong though, you'll have a lot of a harder time with pitch bends and things like that because it's less flexible. So it's basically, you know, there isn't like, oh, a number four will be able to do this. It's like whatever you feel comfortable with. But if I have a piece that's going to have a lot of high notes, I will err on the side of a harder reed. And if I have a piece that has a lot of bendy stuff, I will err on the side of a softer reed so that the reed is more flexible in that way. Wonderful. So I, I would love to take you up on your offer. Of sure. A, Let's a see reed. if I can do this. I should say, 
wait, sorry, before, <laughs> sorry, that's rude. Um, so this is a, a, this piece by Evan Zaporin called Smindau Gmerto. Um, it's for bass clarinet where I sing through the instrument. And when I recorded it, I had a microphone, a contact microphone attached to my throat so that it would pick up the vibrations of my singing better. Um, and so I had, you know, mics on the bass clarinet and then this contact mic on my throat. Um, and uh, it's originally, this is actually the one that the review was about. It's originally a, a three-part Georgian uh, folk song that Evan transcribed for solo bass clarinet.
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a really fun piece to play. <laughs> yeah, it's written in two staves. So the bass clarinet part with a lot of tremolos is on top and then the sung part is on the bottom. That was great. That was lovely. Um, I guess that's a great way to end it. And I'm so grateful to everyone for coming today. And uh, so grateful to you, Jeff, for giving us all this wonderful information and a uh, really fun afternoon. So thank I you. Thank you all. <laughs> Go make a weird sound. Go annoy your, your housemates. <laughs> Sound. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, very much. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>